So this is a, both a summing up, guys, as well as a look ahead. So I think we ought to start up maybe with Chuck and talk about what you noticed at this year's conference and what are some of the key takeaways, and then we'll talk about the future. Thanks, Gene. Uh, there are a lot of key takeaways, so I don't want to uh, belabor it. Uh, you know, some of the new things that we tried was... Uh, it needs to be louder. Is that... Can you hear me now? Can you okay, hear good. Me? Turn up the volume. Okay. So we started a new AIML track, and there are so many AIML conferences. What was really important to us was that we carved out the specific piece that would make sense and be important to the Flash Memory Summit audience. And we got to see some of that today. I thought it was very good. And there is the remainder of the second session uh, of the track this afternoon, so you'll still get a chance to see that. Uh, unfortunately, I've been tied up with so many things, I didn't get to see too many of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the talks, so I'll yeah. pass it on to the people that were actually in mm -hmm. the room to uh, give you more updates. Mm -hmm. And one thing f from the expo floor that we've had for a number of years is the automotive section. I think people should check that out and see how Flash is being used there. And of course, there's such a breadth and spectrum of how people are using Flash. Um, I thought we can go from, start with Tom, talking about what are the next frontiers for non-volatile memory and where, what are the leading challenges as well? So what are the things we can look forward to and what are the challenges? So, uh, Maybe you should use Chuck's. I think they'll, they'll get it turned on. Is this working? No. no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Wow. There we go. Um, Pass so, the time. Yeah. So uh, what was it? one thing interesting about the conference, both the keynotes and also some of the sessions and the exhibits, is there's an awful lot of uh, creativity going into the controllers. I mean, we just saw that in the in last, uh, last few talks. So, and there's uh, really interesting things that are tying also into uh, 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 various fabric technologies for NVMe over fabric. Um, well, I was involved in some sessions that were talking about the emerging memories, which are more than emerging now. You know, 3D Crosspoint, Optane is, is established, um, and uh, uh, MRAM, all the major foundries are planning on uh, MRAM options for uh, embedded products. Um, and Everspin was talking about uh, also, uh, you know, the standalone. They've shipped over 123 million units. Wow. And um, so that's some of the stuff. The other thing I think is with uh, the evolution of the whole software ecosystem with storage and, uh, and the things that's enabling. So mm -hmm. those are some of, the, some of the big trends I saw. Right. There's a lot more too. But right. And I do think it struck me that it's very different than two years ago. Um, how much has been shipped, how mainstream a lot of these technologies are becoming. Uh, did you want to comment, Chuck, or should we go to Dave? No, I just want to make sure. Oh, all right. Dave, what's your thought about what are the key things you Find out you right saw? now. Mike is working. Okay. It is. Yeah, and I think to build on what, what Tom was saying is one of the most interesting things around persistent memory and these new memory types is looking forward how we're going to attach those to the processors right. and how the processors are going to use this memory. Uh, I like to say the future of DRAM is DRAM. The future of NAND is NAND. You know, those aren't going anywhere. Yeah. So the question really is, how do you get this tier in between? How do you do something in between and make good use of it? Uh, certainly we see Intel with Optane now putting that on the DDR bus. But DDR slots are becoming incredibly precious. So to open up another channel, which we see through C6, and to, in the future will be CXL connectivity, uh, bring some new capabilities to the memory subsystem. Right, right. Uh, Rob, do you want to add in or? No, I do. Those are all really good points. Um, for me, it's it's interesting to watch kind of all three dimensions of technology. You know, we've had in the last just two years, you know, limited to that, never mind right. five, last two years, some really interesting advances in compute engines, right? GPUs have taken a major step forward. FPGAs are kind of going the, through this renaissance, right? More people are aware of it. They're getting easier to program, which is great. And now there's all sorts of customized processing elements kind of being driven by the hyperscalers as well. So there's that. Now there's, and some of those were mentioned, now there's interconnects, CXL, CCIX, Gen Z. You know, it's right. an alphabet soup, which is a good thing. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. This mm -hmm. is a good thing to have all this thought being put into interconnect. Right. Because after all, if, if the goal is to move the bits, we're going to have to move the bits efficiently, right. and energy is going to be a barrier right. to that. And then finally, on the, on the storage end, both persistent memory and, and, 
and block technologies, and I totally agree, you know, the future of NAND is NAND, right? There's no question about it. Um, but I'm, I'm particularly impressed with what MRAM is doing right now, not to discredit any other technologies, but the MRAM folks seem to be moving ahead very quickly, which is great. And as you all know, memory technologies are all trade-offs, right? It's, there's probably about 15 different variables that go into a particular memory technology. So I think the key going ahead, for uh, especially in the non-volatile memory, persistent memory area, is what kind of trade-offs are you, the consumer of said technology, going to accept? Right, and therefore what is built into systems. Mm -hmm. And then kind of everything follows, right? How do we interconnect them? How do we mer you know, merge them up with processing units? What does systems design look like? So there's, there's just an awful lot of activity going on. Absolutely, and uh, one let thing me, that- let me, let me push Rob a little bit here though. I mean, do we need to move the data and is computational storage going to find yeah. a role to play? I think that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no doubt. Rob is a storage guy up here. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I, I, that he's, he's stealing my thunder here, so it's uh -huh. bad, yeah, it's bad data. But no, that's absolutely true. And again, it's, it's more, it's, in one way it's more of the same but in another way, you know, literally and figuratively moving processing extremely close to the data in storage form, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to memory or maybe mm -hmm. in conjunction mm -hmm. with memory and putting elements down there that, you know, can access the data very efficiently, much more so than a typical host to storage could yeah. by any means. And now the, the goal is, okay, now that we've got this thing called computational storage and the, at the show, there are examples of SAME mm -hmm. on the floor that you can go see, mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. implementations, which is great. Yeah. So now, how do we use it? How right. do applications interface to it? And yeah. more importantly, how do OSs deal with these things right. so called I'd like, computational storage devices? I'd like to mention and put in a good word for IT, the cloud people are fun and the hyperscaler stuff, but their needs are somewhat different. And I mean, if you take the example of Google, they've got all kinds of processors and all kinds of interconnects and all kinds of accelerators, and they're using them in different ways, some for AI, some for TensorFlow, and all that stuff. In IT, it's a little bit different. They've got to worry a bit more about your standard issue databases, transactional backend processing. And I think what would be cool is to emphasize, too, the role of IT in kind of taking an inventory. What do they got? What do they want to do? What do they want to ship out? to the cloud, and which of these technologies are they going to apply and where? Because they might adopt some of them in different places for different well, reasons. And, or and I think that's one of the interesting things that yep. I've observed with computational storage over the last mm -hmm. two, three years. You know, it was really an idea mm -hmm. that got traction. Right. And what I, my personal observation from last year to this year is how those companies have really started to identify those applications mm -hmm. where they add value. Right. You know, whether it's compression, decompression, or image recognition, you know, each of the companies mm -hmm. kind of has their own area that they're addressing. But uh, they're not trying to, last year it felt like trying to be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. And this year is much more focused, which is good, which means that they're really starting to engage with their customers and find the, where they add value. Yeah, where they can do and it. And just to add, uh, you're talking about the IT. So first of all, you know, we live in a hybrid world, you know, we in are. the cloud. It's, it's, it's both local. Um, it's in the cloud, right. but the other thing is developing. And this is, uh, besides the changes in the, in the general scaling of semiconductors, mm -hmm. right? Um, the other thing that's going to change, it's changing, really is having a big impact on this whole computational storage side is mm -hmm. that we're going to be doing more stuff at the edge. There's right. more data that needs to be processed than stored. Yep. And that's going to happen either at the edge or the endpoint. Yep. That combined with, uh, you know, going from generalized processors, these specialized domain-specific right. processors are just going to cause a revolution. And, and that's part of what's behind this whole role with computational storage, but that's part of a bigger thing, which mm -hmm. is uh, the disaggregation of computing yes. and networking and storage. Yeah. And, and, and this also feeds into in the data centers yeah. and that whole composable infrastructure. Exactly. The that's where you get a Gen Z and some, yeah. you know. Could you spend a minute just explaining, because not everybody knows exactly what composable is and there's a lot of software involved. Just explain about the uh, impact of the composable computing. I mean, for, for the IT guys, actually. For the IT guys, yeah. okay. So um, the idea there is that we're, we're having pools of, of, uh, pools of resources, okay? which it's sort of an extension of these ideas of virtualization where I could create these pools, I can allocate them out to, right. uh, to um, allocate them out for different, app, for right. different applications. Right. Um, this is own namespaces that people have been talking right. about as one element, you know, probably part of doing that on the flash side. Right. Um, 
and, the, and actually there's a whole, uh, and especially for the hyperscale or for the large data centers, these ideas are extremely attractive. Exactly. And, if, and if you go out on the exhibit floor, you find Liquid and a whole bunch of mm -hmm. other companies that are providing, uh, yeah. you know, resources that can support that infra right. the infrastructure to make that happen. Right, right, right. One thing that I want to make sure to touch on before we go is the new materials. Uh, where was I? Where's my audiovisual aid here? Oh, well, I'm not picking on this company, but I saw this out in the hallway, and it says emerging non-volatile memory, and it's really no, don't, fascinating. Don't pick on my friends at Letty. They're a very, I'm very not good, on them. Uh, very good organization. No, no, it's great, but I mean, they're probably not the only ones, right? But the thing is, in looking at this, they're talking about completely different materials. So can you explain that, Dave? Yeah, certainly I can dive in, having uh, earned dive many in. scars in the memory business of trying <laughs> memory different materials. So yeah. it's it, it literally, we used to joke, uh, there's still hope because we haven't tried every single element on the periodic table. Only two, only two thirds of them. Yes. Well, so. and it's the combinations. So there's <laughs> magic. And then there's the combinations, which are endless. So, uh, and, and Letty is a, a consortium that does research. So yeah. they do look at a broad variety of things. I think that that's one of the, the tricky things with memory technologies. Um, Tom alluded to it a little bit earlier that, uh, you know, there's so many different things you can try. Uh, another uh, bit of wisdom is any idiot, and I've been that idiot sometimes, can get a single bit to switch. But getting enough of them to switch and getting enough of them to reliably behave mm -hmm. is what really is the trick. And uh, mm -hmm. Mark mm -hmm. Webb, who we have seen at this conference, does mm -hmm. a very good job of laying out the life cycle of what it takes to go from one bit switching in a material set all the way through to having something which is truly manufacturable. Right. And he says, look, it's, it's about a, at least a four, five, up to 10 year process. Could be. That's so right. the material sets that are out there and, and many get tried, yeah. many get uh, yeah. a little bit of funding, get a little mm -hmm. bit of research, but those that make the grade really narrows down. We have not seen a significant change in that right. over the last five years. Right. It's basically still PCM, which is 3D cross point and some other right. variants. Yeah. We've got RAM of different types and then MRAM. They're answering different application needs. So PCM is really going after oh. that high density. This is Jim Handy. High density memory. And Jim can expand on this more. Uh, and then, <laughs> yeah, now then, that you're here. then MRAM is very clearly finding a value proposition as embedded MRAM uh, to do, you know, lower density, but do some, uh, emphasize that speed. And then we do see uh, our RAM kind of migrating over the past few years. Mm -hmm. And so many of those AI talks that, mm -hmm. Uh, we've seen uh, RM looks like it could be something which is a good fit there. Right. Absent that, the other material sets, there's, a, there's quite a few things that are, let's say, below the surface that right. we, we see once in a while. Yeah. Uh, carbon nanotubes being one of them. Oh, yes. That's been around Ferro. for a while. That one's been around oh, for a while. One, years, of the, yeah. one of the newest <laughs> ones is uh, ferroelectric high K materials, yeah. which yeah. ferroelectric uh, FRAM got kind of abandoned because of scaling, but it's yeah. come back to life in the last two, three years right. with the ferroelectricity yeah. in hafnia oxide. So and the reason to do this is that we do have to think ahead, and things are going well now, but I mean, they're thinking ahead to, you know, what if we need That's some possible, new but I think I'd, I'd give the cautionary tale yeah. of the, the road is littered with the wreckage of those who yes, thought they have, could and haven't have been able to. But we have to do it in order to well, find out. Well, but there's only so much VC patience and funding uh, that can, can very go practical. along with that. But very there practical. is, in a sense, a Cambrian explosion of memory technologies. Okay, now what do you mean by that, Tom? I kind of well, know what you mean so, by that. Um, and the, the Precambrian era was yeah. like, you know, built. You're talking over, geology here. Yeah, talking geology and, and fossils. I happen to be a geology major, so that's why. So over a billion <laughs> years ago, things didn't have backbones, and they, you know, like the, the age of worms, essentially, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, there was a period of time they called it the Cambrian explosion, okay. when you get all these different life forms to just, you know, create an immense amount of variety to fill different niches, mm -hmm. environmental niches. A bunch of them died off, but a bunch of them led to, well, us, for example. Mm -hmm. And we're now in, a, in an age where, like you say, we're not getting rid of the DRAM, we're not getting rid of the SRAM, we're not getting rid of the NAND, but right. we're adding new stuff in there. Yeah. And, and we're not getting rid of hard drives, probably not getting rid of tapes. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of an explosion in, the, mm -hmm. in available technologies. Yeah, but how many of those are we going to see commercially viable? I, I, I like to say that I don't know what the number is, but yeah. to launch a new memory technology yeah. is a half billion dollar problem. Yeah. Maybe it costs more than that. 
So how yeah. many companies or entities have the resources to put that in? So just because Very a startup, cute. and again, hard-earned scars on my part, <laughs> uh, have raised $50 million or $100 million to explore something does not mean it's going to be successful. Right. And uh, net net on that is you have to own the fab. If you own the fab, you can really uh, make some things that happen. That does make a difference, having a partnership with someone's yeah. facility. It's just like an evolution thing, right? Okay. Gene, I'd like to give a little Absolutely. perspective that I have, too, yes. on that. You know, we're, all of us pay close attention to the research that goes on, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's every week or every other week you'll see some announcement roll across that some research lab somewhere has found some new property or some new material, and you will see the phrase. I want you to look out for this. You'll see the phrase, <laughs> and it will be great for storage. <laughs> okay, I, I want you to know that whenever you hear that expression, the person that said it has never worked in storage. Okay, because nothing is great for storage, right? If if the stuff we were using was great for storage, we couldn't afford it. Hmm. You've got to run that storage right up to the edge where you're exposing every single problem of it and build a system around it to make sure that it works a billion, billion, billion times. Well, it's not That's just a, a billion times, too. It's also the statistics uh, that get behind it. Get enough bits that reliably switch in a way that you want. I mean, that's a characteristic of non-volatile memory. Yeah. A few years ago, too, I saw a paper where a guy stood up and showed an excellent switching characteristics, and the crowd was ooing and aahing, and then at the end he showed he plugged two electrodes into a banana yeah. to demonstrate yeah. how well it switched. So, again, yeah. Lots of things switch. Well, I want to get that, a little... that also, oh, you, go you know, it goes along with something that, that uh, Intel fellow Al Fazio said. No, I th I'm sorry. It was um, Scott uh, oh, DeBoer. Is that the name at Micron? Yeah, yeah, he's a Micron fellow. He's, he said something at the launch of the 3D crosspoint memory. He said um, it pretty much anything can be used for bit storage, including eggshells. The real <laughs> trick is getting the selector. And, you know, that's something that a lot of people do find the things sore. I, I, I mentioned this to Al Fazio, you know, last year yeah. at an event here at the Flash Memory Summit. Yeah. And he said, you know, somebody once found that even human saliva can store a bit. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh -oh. but you need a selector, and the selector technology that's is true. really, you know, where the devil is in the yeah. details. Yeah. Now, we didn't even talk about DNA storage. That's right, but it's in here. <laughs> I, I just want to change uh, uh, the topic just a little bit, Chuck, and come back to you, because one thing has struck me, I mean, here we are in Silicon Valley, and it's seen as the worldwide center for research and innovation, but clearly innovation's coming from multiple places, including, obviously, Asia Pacific, which you know very well, uh, but other places, too, and I think it was Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or somebody who said, you never know where the next thing's gonna, or the next idea's gonna come from. It could be down the street and across the world and so on. So could you just talk about worldwide participation? We do see uh, a lot of worldwide participation even in this show here. Uh, it must be happening. Didn't we just hear that saying in the Super Women in Flash Award? Right. We did indeed, I was gonna mention that. <laughs> who, yeah, we did. who let we this did. guy on the stage? That's what I mean. All right, go ahead. Yeah, we just uh, gave our second annual Superwoman in Flash Award, and that phrase was what uh, Colleen Sanchez yeah. used in her very moving, I felt, uh, nice. uh, acceptance speech. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, you know, we have a, a diversity and inclusivity effort here, and that's students, um, gender, ethnicity, worldwide, uh, differently abled. We want to be inclusive about that. And the thing that she said was what was just quoted here is, why do you want to do that? Because you never know where the next great idea is coming yeah. from. And you need that difference of experience to bring that difference of thought in. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's part of the outreach. But uh, in particular, if you look at uh, the, the world, you see China consumes more semiconductors. They spend more on semiconductors than they do on oil. And you, you can't make oil, but you sure can make semiconductors. Wow. So there's a tremendous opportunity there, and so we want to help provide that form. So for several years now, we've had a China track, and it has grown. But I want to tell you, with the recent tensions, it's been uh, challenging for visas, for example. We have to work many months in advance to uh, get visas, and mm -hmm. some people are concerned mm -hmm. about traveling. Some people right. cannot get visas. So we've had the program in flux. Right, and if you true. were there last year, uh, we, our panel discussion was CEOs from... Uh, Taiwan and mainland China on the stage together, and it was a fascinating discussion. Yeah. And today we had a re, or I'm sorry, this year we had a research review uh, in the afternoon on, on Tuesday uh, of the research that's going on in China. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a great opportunity if you want to see 
what's going on. You know, the, the folks that I spoke to from China were saying, Flash is huge in China. Everybody is, is focused and growing and opportunity, so make the contacts. Right, so yeah, Rob. I'd like to add one thing to that too, and if you remember your history, I'm sure many of you do. Uh, before, and I'll throw a number out here, before 1970-ish, the center of the universe, or seemingly so, for computation research and, and uh, you know, electronics and whatnot was the East Coast. It was Pennsylvania and New Jersey, specifically Bell Boston. Labs. Yep, uh, that's exactly rooms. right, the invention of the transistor. Yep. Uh, and using funky materials like germanium and whatnot, which we don't use today, but guess what? That might be coming back, too. <laughs> but that's uh, all things in a circle. Yeah. So, and, and until, again, the early 70s and Fairchild and Intel and companies like that mm -hmm. started up out here, the East Coast was literally the center. You, that's where you went if you wanted mm -hmm. to study computer science back then, mm -hmm. right? So that lasted for... 30 years or so, and now uh, a lot of concentration has been out here, although, to be fair, in other places as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm just not surprised at all that a lot of momentum is now global in other countries, literally putting in resources either at the state level or at the private level to develop technologies mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who knows? 20 years from now, the, the Silicon Valley may not be the center of the universe anymore. Oh. It may be somewhere else. We just don't know. Yeah, that would be uh, you know, something that I'd like to say about that, too, is that, um, you know, we've got uh, 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 CEA Letty developing an awful lot of MRAM yeah, stuff out of France. We've got um, IMEC in Belgium, where mm -hmm. they're doing a lot of ferroelectric research. Mm -hmm. We've got Webit Nano and I think a couple other firms That's in Israel. 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 Who are doing re right. stuff, and so yeah, it is just kind of all yeah. over the place. Yeah. yeah, it is naturally places that have wonderful academic institutions. True, but uh, you know, still, it's right. it's right. not right. just in one yeah. place or in two yeah. places. And Dave made yeah. a great point about deep pockets. I'd like you to expand on that. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's where we see whether it's uh, public-private partnerships in China or city-federal government partnerships in China investing tremendous resources. Um, and the one I'd like to go back to, build on Chuck's point, is especially in AI. I think this is mm -hmm. where we've seen uh, a lot of very advanced research come out of China, perhaps have an advantage sure. in some areas mm -hmm. around AI. So mm -hmm. the memory subsystems and systems which fit into AI will get a lot of mm -hmm. traction and support mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's going to be uh, quite a lot of growth. Mm -hmm. I think we also need to take it with uh, a, re a certain amount of reasonableness. Uh, mm -hmm. A few months ago I read you know, how Micron is severely threatened by the emergence of memory players in China. This is really a little bit of overstatement because if you look at their, there certainly are memory fabs that are being built in China, are companies that are coming up to speed, but they're a little bit behind in technology. They don't have the same advances. And if you look at the amount of capacity that they're gonna bring online, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's still pretty incremental. Now we know as business people, mm -hmm. a small displacement in, in supplier demand can have an effect mm -hmm. on pricing. So mm -hmm. I would agree that there could be that mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. But in terms of a real tangible impact, I don't think the emergence of these, these memory fabs are as much of an issue as the governmental tension, yeah. which is causing, and I'm quite con personally concerned about this, it is causing uh, the development of two ecosystems. Separately. I you know, think Tom so. Friedman said that like the other day in his column. And I just don't think that's good for anyone, right. any one of us in, in the right. business here in the to U.S. or anyone diverge. in business in China. That's right. Um, I don't think we're going to see, years ago, China looked to develop its own standards around mm -hmm. things, but mm -hmm. that was not largely, uh, that was unsuccessful for the most part. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's in terms of standardization, mm -hmm. but I think it's in terms of uh, the buy and sell relationships yeah start yeah. to become firewalled off yeah. Yeah. Uh, from one side or the other side of the Pacific. And it would be interesting to see, too, how that plays with open source. I go to OpenStack all the time, and there are a lot of Chinese firms involved with OpenStack and open source. It would be interesting to see if they get involved as well as the semiconductor side. Yeah. Yeah, well, Chuck the, raised the, a really good point there, though, too, when, when he was talking about how uh, uh, China's semiconductor imports are larger than their petroleum imports. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, the, they're, they're like this huge segment of the population of the world, and you know, so it seems like they ought to be using, uh, you know, a lot more in the way of petroleum. But, you know, for as far as memories go, memories are the easiest way to get into semiconductors mm -hmm. if you've got cash. China has cash, mm -hmm. and they're getting in there, and it's just like the most natural thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And so trying to stop that is like, you know, the old fable of the king 
who to prove to his underlings he was not all powerful, he had them take him down to the ocean and he yelled at the ocean to stop having the tide raise. <laughs> it didn't do anything. <laughs> I think that, you know, and, and we put out a report on, on China and what they're doing in memories and it was like, the more I worked on the report, mm -hmm. the more I thought, well, yeah, of course, you know, this has got to happen. And really, you know, there isn't anything the United States can do to stop it. And it's probably not in the United States' best interest, mm -hmm. as Dave was saying, mm -hmm. to even try to stop it. Yeah. Well, you know, John, there's a... Oh. Go ahead. So, I just think the difficulty right now in this environment is uh, one random tweet can send things in a different direction. Now, now we're not going to get into that. No shortage of those. Which is not quite frustrating. Not going to get into that. But Tom wanted to compliment Jim. Oh, yeah. I was just going to make... Um, so I was just going to make a comment on, you know, is consolidation ever going to happen in this industry? And in a sense, what we're actually seeing is more players right now. And, you know, I go to the show here, and every year I'm seeing new startups, mm -hmm. you know, from various places, you know, the thing we're pointing out here. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, this is, a, this is an industry that has not matured yet. It's an industry that still has a lot of development to go. Yeah. Yeah. There's still games to play, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the, the purchases may be not between the companies themselves, maybe vertical integration plays when mm -hmm. there is, is new acquisitions. Right. Right. But, but, you know, it just shows the enormous value that memory and storage has for our economies, totally. international economies. Yeah. And well, that's also why China, China wants to be part of that. What, what applications do you think are driving that? I definitely agree with you that there's continue to be new startups. But Anything, what, everything you can think of. It's like, what doesn't <laughs> use memory and storage? Yeah. You know, it's well, computing. Well, we heard about facial recognition and yeah, all the AI cars, the car stuff. Yeah, this, uh, I think this is, what we're seeing is an increase of the art of the possible. Right, it's, it's kind of like chicken and egg, you know, these new technologies come along or new adaptations thereof and they say, hmm, maybe I could implement algorithm X or Y and Z where previously it would yeah. be, yeah. you know, not cost effective or too slow or, you know, name your reason mm -hmm. to do that. But also on the, on the consolidation point, I, I view this kind of as a pendulum, right? We, we see a lot of startups mm -hmm. and then we see industry consolidation and yeah. it reaches a certain point and the pendulum comes back and we okay. see more startups. Right. And, and, and that's true in, in lots of different areas, of course, but if you just consider enterprise storage just as a domain by itself, mm -hmm. I remember uh, working at a company and, and being VP of architecture in the year 2000, we had 90 distinguishable enterprise storage companies mm -hmm. wow. that were out there. Mm -hmm. and, and today we have a handful, yeah, true. right? So yeah. now, who's to say that yeah. more and more companies won't yeah. get into that area? Yeah. Again, you Chuck, see this pendulum think, effect all the time. Did you want to say something there? I was. I did. I think Dave loaded up here. Well, I, was I just know say, he is. I, I, mean, I was just going to say that Micron, after, after Micron used to be number nine in the DRAM business. Yeah. Because there were 50 different players. Yeah. So yeah. The, you, you do see that. Can I make a philosophical content uh, comment? I think people, uh, having been a journalist before I was an analyst, people in the industry, I just make it very broad, are always looking for winners and losers. Why shouldn't they? It goes with equities and all that stuff. But I mean, I think this is an area where, I'm not gonna be a Pollyanna here, there will be multiple winners. Not everyone will win, but there will be multiple winners because there are different segments. And I think that's something to bear in mind. I mean, I think if someone from a business magazine says, yes, there'll be a big winner and a big loser, but actually they're probably gonna be three or four winners or losers actually. Tom, did you wanna, or Chuck? Yeah, I wanted to f follow up on the international question that sure. we're talking about here and, no. and tie it into inclusivity because as we focus on the U.S. and China, that's by definition not inclusive. And I'm glad that Jim uh, mentioned the efforts of uh, the European yeah. groups. Mm -hmm. And I was just talking with the representative here from uh, uh, CEA, Leti, and tried to increase their uh, involvement in, in mm -hmm. Flash Memory Summit mm -hmm. and especially... Uh, giving us a survey maybe of the international research that's going on mm -hmm. uh, in Europe. So mm -hmm. those kinds of ideas. And then mm -hmm. with that said, mm -hmm. you know, how do we reach out? Is there an effort in Africa? Is there one in, in India, India that focuses yeah. on this or the Middle East? You know, we don't know who's working there. So if you do, this is where you can feed back to us and say, right. here's some people to, uh, right. who are doing interesting things. Right. And a case in point uh, is South America. I, would, I do some uh, pre-conference tutorials, and last year I had some uh, folks in the audience, in my class, that were researchers from a Brazilian university. Mm -hmm. So afterward, they invited me down. You know, they came here to Flash Memory Summit, and they invited me down, and they have a government program. Uh, you know, Brazil is a huge market, and in order for you to uh, sell your product there without a tariff, 
you have to make some local content. Right, so what, what does that mean? Instead of selling your computer, you sell the computer parts and they assemble it locally. Well, okay, then when they get good at that, then they have to maybe stuff the boards, right? Uh, so you send them the chips and they stuff the boards. And then after that, what do you do? Well, then you make a packaging plant. You buy the dye. Mm -hmm. And then you slice the wafers <laughs> and put them in the package. Right? <laughs> so they keep going up the road, yeah. and they were asking me to help them direct their, uh, yeah. their flash efforts. Yeah. So these sorts of things are, are yeah. possible, yeah. and cast that net wide. Yeah, and so. I want to add something about software, because I was in the software group at IDC, and you know, really, we didn't talk about it so much at the conference level. We're talking more and more each year when you talk about application acceleration and how fast, some of the examples of how fast does a database go and all that. I think it does bring in the software and services add on to the ecosystem. And I think, you know, when you mention India, India is tremendous in software. So, so I just think it's, it could be a bigger opportunity if we if we paint the, a bigger circle around what has uh, got flash in the middle. There's the software, there's the services, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you do see some of it out on the floor. Uh, Tom, did you want to add to that? I'm sorry. Oh, oh yeah. Well, no, 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 about the software content. Oh, about uh, software. Oh, and uh, enablement. And enablement. There's data management software and so on. Oh, yeah. There's a, uh, well, the other part of it, the software and IP firmware, you know, yeah. so let's go, uh, there's an awful lot of development going on in those areas in particular. And yeah. there's the companies out here, you go into the... And if we there. start counting it, it would be real money or something. Well, yeah. I mean, there are people <laughs> actually make money. Arm Thanks. on the IP, Arm is a big, big example. Of that. Exactly. Uh, Jim, did you have a comment? No. Okay. Well, so we should, before we finish, who's got the leading edge flash, uh, not by company, but what are the leading edge uses for flash and what are the bleeding edge? In other words, we we're talking before, what's mainstream today? It's amazing to see how NVMe now is just mainstream. It's not even controversial. I saw the difference over the last two years. But what's bleeding edge? What's the thing that it's just a little bit further out there that we haven't, uh, haven't so, talked so I'm about? So I'm going to poke Chuck to my my right here, <laughs> that, uh, we, and he knows, we've talked at, for Flash Memory Summit about how to make it more than the enterprise storage show. Sure. And we've tried uh, different things, some successfully, some unsuccessfully, and so I think that that, to me, is still the driving, edu uh, dr the driving application for this show mm -hmm. and for that larger community. That's a, a great usage for, for NAND Flash uh, to put it into enterprise storage. Uh, bleeding Edge, I think, look back to Chuck here, that we put together for the first time this AI session. I honestly, I invited a few companies. I was very pleased that many of them accepted, but we had a lot more submissions, so it turned into a full day session. Mm. So it looks like just from that sort of involvement that AI could be a very good driving uh, application for us. Now, AI means so many different things. Mm -hmm. To be a little more specific, it's both data center training, data center inference, and then edge inference. The one I'm particularly excited to listen in, participate in, and listen in this afternoon, mm -hmm. is companies doing very interesting things with non-volatile memory for edge inference, which allows these uh, chips to operate at extremely low power mm -hmm. in older technologies, so they're not very expensive. Mm -hmm. What does it do? It really replaces the MAC, the multiply and accumulate, which the compute system doesn't do very well, but they're using non-volatile memory bits for in an analog capability, hmm. which allows in a single cycle you come in and rip right through that neural net and you get an answer out of the trained neural net wow. that tells you this was the word that was spoken or that's the image that I'm seeing. Yeah. That to me is a, a personally a fascinating mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. where I could not have anticipated this yeah. three years ago yeah. that companies would be using non-volt, well-known, e-flash, yeah. non-volt. Yeah. Non There's a whole video thing way. going on, isn't there? The say video, it uh, applying AI to video, going through tons and tons of video, let's say at the edge, it, it, and finding the important instances it can be done that way. That's yeah. more the tagging of particular images right. and, and going through there. But uh, that's just one example right. for the edge inference. And the, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is if you were to use a, a, a traditional von Neumann compute architecture to do that task, the research from IBM says it would take 20 gigawatts of power. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have 20 gigawatts, you know, there's no battery that's gonna do it. Your brain operates at 18 watts of power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's or many orders of magnitude mm -hmm. difference by mm -hmm. applying von Neumann right. uh, architecture right. to this that right. says it's just not gonna work on the edge. Mm -hmm. And what we see is this sort of hybrid approach where some, uh, you're certainly using von Neumann architecture for some parts of the processing, mm -hmm. but then you go into the analog domain to do some of this other compute. And that, that to me is fascinating. And the company is presenting have real chips that solve real problems mm -hmm. and they're not terribly expensive. So that's a, that's a, a cool great application. Angle, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd like right. to, uh, as they say, double down on that comment. And you know, for me with a background in, in enterprise storage and memory, you know, you want to talk about the leading edge. Well, you already said the word edge, right? By <laughs> definition, I think that's where the leading edge is in today's it's in the edge. Very well, very well taken point. There are computational methods that were used in the past, certain types of analog computing, but especially, you know, you know, you think of a wind turbine or a cell tower, two classic examples of edge, right? You're not gonna put, you know, 12, 19 inch racks in there. It's just not possible. And the power uh, distribution there, again, is very, very low. You don't have a lot of power to, to work with, sometimes no power at all. So these very specific algorithms that are using, you know, computation in memory, that sort of thing, those are really, really interesting. Now, it's exactly polar opposite than general purpose computing, right? But if you're out there on the edge in a cell tower and you're trying to figure out, you know, what are the diagnostics on 170,000, you know, 5G connections, A, you don't have a lot of time to do it, right? So you must have fast compute engines and, and so, Processing the data right there in place, in yeah. situ, as people yeah. say, is, is really important. But also, again, the application of analog techniques to solve certain problems in combination mm -hmm. with digital techniques, mm -hmm. I think is, I mean, if, if I was, a, you know, an 18-year-old in, in school, that's what I'd be studying. Yeah. What, one more thing on the, on the AI application, sure. and this also feeds in the whole software thing, is that we're also starting to see and you know, to some extent it dates back like NV endurance, but using AI technologies, machine learning, to make our storage either devices or systems right. work better. Mm -hmm. And so that is a big trend, I think, too. Mm -hmm. So we're actually using it to make, uh, to make our businesses right. and operations better. Absolutely, uh, mm -hmm. one area that I had looked at uh, in my research was metadata. There is a lot of metadata, but if you do it manually, it takes forever, and a lot of the CSPs are applying they're very good AI to zipping through a lot of metadata a whole lot faster. And I think that's just one example, but a practical example of how this can happen like right now. And I know the big guys are all doing this. So. Well, and, and to uh, shameless plug here, I give a talk at 210 <laughs> about the future of storage systems. <laughs> and metadata turns out to be, you know, no pun intended, the absolute key to processing data efficiently. Uh. Right, like you said, how do you herd a million devices? Well, yeah. you, obviously you have to have metadata, but literally separating metadata from its inherent storage, yeah. right, and treating it like a much different thing, which it is, by mm -hmm. the way, it is just not, you know, the bits are easy, the metadata are hard, right? Yeah. So that kind of approach, I think, is gonna be absolutely key yeah. to moving ahead and getting these, you know, Million, yeah. imagine a million devices sitting on a fabric and not right. necessarily host attached. Right, and I wanted and to, all supplying I data want to follow on what you're saying because earlier in the discussion, we talked about where to put the data or what is the optimal place to put the data. And it kind of all begs that question. You know, I mean, we've all been following computing for 20, 25 years or whatever. There's, there's an actual change, not just cloud computing, but where we're putting the smarts in the cloud. It's moving, it's disaggregating, and we have to, in the audience, keep up with that because we have to rethink how we're doing the whole thing now that we have hybrid cloud. And I don't know what the number is, yeah. but how much data actually makes its way back to the data center from the edge? It's a small fraction. Right. Let's say it's 1% of the data. Right. The other 99% of the data is either thrown away, not processed at all, just sitting or, or right. just decided that it's not, you know, you process it a little bit and not use it. Yeah. And I think one of the other uh, keynoters two days ago said there's gold and then our bits was yeah. the yep. uh, statement, yep. That's right. in that if we could analyze that other 99% of get data, something out of it. some capability yeah. to do it. So even today, as mm -hmm. we think about storage and demand of, of storage increasing, mm -hmm. uh, that's for data that's being passed all the way back mm -hmm. to the data center. Right. And we're not thinking about the intermediate levels that yeah. also could be processing data sure. and doing some amount of yeah. uh, intelligent operation. And totally, and we don't want to drag 
large amounts of data over the network because who wants no, to do that? Yeah, there's a cost, there, there's a distance and a cost that's right. associated with data transmission. Right. Right. And you have to consider it, whether it's right. you know nanometers right. on a chip or right. you know kilometer right. miles up to, uh, to a data center in Oregon somewhere. I mean, there's a, a tremendous cost yeah. of transmitting that data. What's interesting, though, on the side is looking at providers like Equinix, the name comes up a lot, but there are others that kind of get the fastest part of the internet to connect to what you've got, rather than literally some people ship a lot of data in a device that goes on a UPS truck. We don't want to do that, right? So, um, so I think there is going to be more of this super link kind of thing where you do have to move data, where you do have to transfer data in bulk. Otherwise, you're just going to spend all Yeah, now, the interesting thing is, yeah. uh, Dave hit it, and I hope you realize it yeah. out there. And you know, you've, you hear these figures, there will be 163 zettabytes yes, created in 2025. That. Yeah. That's all great. Well, go back to square one and mm -hmm. study the output of the entire media storage industry, mm -hmm. right? Generally thought of as rotating media, you know, magnetic hard drive, NAND, and tape. Right, rotating linear Invented media. Here in if Santa you Santa. study the entire output of every company in the world involved with that, it's a hair over one zettabyte annually. Okay. That's how many bits they're making that we can store stuff in. Mm -hmm. Right. So take that one zettabyte. Let's say it's perfectly consumed and maybe a little data reduction. So I'll I'll, I'll call it three zettabytes. Right. We'll be we'll be generous. <laughs> right. More like two, but that's yeah. another story for another yeah. day. But now, I get, it's 2025, and I've got 18 bazillion edge devices out there, and they're generating that 163 zettabytes. Like Dave said, you're going to store, you're going to persist this much of it. The right. rest you literally cannot store because there is no media to store it on. Wow. Yeah, only about 1% or 2%. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So what this is the CERN problem, right? They generate petabytes and petabytes yeah. and petabytes of yeah. information yeah. per yeah. event, and they can store about this much of it. Yeah, and also people talk about the planes, how much plane in a journey terabytes. is generating in terabytes and you know, it's everybody's the, favorite is to, to give the airplane thing the certain thing though, that really resonates oh, with me because i i and have considered so trying to figure out how many wafers worth of silicon are in the detector for the uh, i forget what the name is of that collider the oh, the, large, uh, hadron. large hadron yeah the large, hadron large hadron collider, collider. Yeah. i would bet that the number of wafers used in the instrumentation for that are somewhere on the order of an entire month's output of a oh, wow. large megafab. Huh. It's just it's colossal how much, and e that's got to be all generating just data out their ears. Yeah. So, so I think we've come full, full circle to how do you then push compute capability out towards yes. the data where the data resides. The data. Okay, how do we so do it's got to happen. It's got to happen because if it doesn't happen, we're just going to get like paralyzed. Well, something. that's for the computational storage, but even if you go into the future, it's in memory processing. And that's, uh, you know. Right. And there's Can we, in the mo remaining moments, uh, PM came up a lot, persistent memory as a thing. Um, where are we today? We know NVMe has gone way forward. Where are we with PM and where is it yet to go? Do you want to? Yeah, just at the beginning, I, I'll jump in on this because yeah. that's, yeah. that's my strong suit. Oh, okay. Uh, I think, you know, persistent memory, Intel has done a uh, really great job in, in one area, uh, mm -hmm. or multiple areas, but one area in particular which is working very hard with the software developers and creating models so the applications can become persistent memory aware. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, not many of the applications are rewritten yet. That's a not long yet. cycle problem, but the foundation is there. They've done a mm -hmm. particularly good job with that. I think where, where Intel has struggled a little bit, it was well understood when 3D Crosspoint came out. Mm -hmm. Not particularly that great in mm -hmm. SSDs, mm -hmm. but start there because that's mm -hmm. the nearest game. Well, the SSDs yeah. are the things that cause it to But it was be really, bad. Yes. was to put it on the memory bus yeah. and mm -hmm. go ahead and put it on the memory bus and, and make use of it there. The value proposition was more memory and that still exists, mm -hmm. that now you can, you know, put terabytes of memory out on your memory bus. Same One of the problems though has been that the DDR slots have become increasingly valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going from three DIMM slots per channel and six channels. Yes, we're going to eight channels, but two DIMM slots. So we've lost some capability there. And then also to go over, I think it's 5,000. I can't remember the number, but uh, you, you're going down to one DIMM on per channel. So if DIMM slots are valuable today, and I asked a super micro guy two nights ago, how many servers do you ship with empty DIMM slots? And he said, mm, none. Uh. You know, wow. there, there really aren't empty DIMM slots there. So 
I think what we have to, and I alluded to this earlier, is look for a different way to attach persistent memory uh. to take advantage of it. That's where reusing the PCIe electricals, and now they're being mapped to what's called the CXL bus. Yeah, is the, what new, uh, the is new alternatives, forward. yes. Mm -hmm. That becomes a, a very interesting attachment mm -hmm. for persistent memory, mm -hmm. as well as just doing simple things like memory expansion. Yeah. Yeah. The key, though, for persistent memory to take off is for the applications to take advantage right. of the persistence being yeah. there. Software again. So, exactly. so we're, yes, and so we <laughs> d definitely do come back to it. So, and I have the fortune of sitting next to the two Olympic cycle guy. Because it wasn't that your term that yeah. you coined that it takes right. two Olympic Double cycles, Olympic cycle. yeah, yeah, in order oh, to, right. to get anything, any new software changed right. through. What, so wasn't yeah. software supposed to be the easy thing to change? Oh yeah, that's uh, no. that's right. Uh, that's supposed no, to, be to that point, and and uh, Dave is hitting it on the head there. If you consider that you know the mundane DDR slot, which we're all very familiar with, right, and it's also it turns out to be a pin problem, right? These are each 288 pins. Right, so how many pins are we going to allow on, you know, said CPU or other processing element? And we already have, what, eight, 9,000 now, maybe more? But that, that's a problem. So what I see for persistent memory moving forward is if you consider the HBM and HBM2 approach, right? It's, it's DRAM, but it's a serialized interface. It's completely different than the DDR interface. And the net result is the throughput gains you can get with a serial interface are much, you know, much significantly higher than you can over a DDR channel. So maybe not, you know, this year or even next, but persistent memory in mm -hmm. such a form with a serialized interface, mm -hmm. that could get really interesting in a hurry. And let me just add one more thing, which is my shameless plug for uh, speaking this afternoon on AI ML 302, oh. is once you, <laughs> we should have all that, go there. <laughs> once you have that bus and you put persistent memory out there, it's not just there to feed the CPU. You can do peer-to-peer -peer communication on that bus. Right. So the accelerators, which we've seen an explosion right. of accelerators, right. accelerators can now take advantage of that persistent right. memory without right. going back through the CPU. Oh, that's a good point. And yeah. that adds, again, adds right. value to right. uh, the capability. You know, I want to ask, oh, and then I want to ask Chuck a question. Oh, this is a quickie. Um, okay. There's another side of this we haven't really talked about yet. There's a whole change in packaging, because you're just talking about the density. They're talking about these really wild heterogeneous, I mean, people are working now on these really wild heterogeneous structures that put together chips, they're, they're actually building things in the backside of chips and making extremely thin memory processing, networking. All this is, all this is you know, bringing things closer to each other. Yeah. Yeah. So aspect. what I want to ask, since we're sort of wrapping up here, and Chuck, you have that sort of, you know, the, the broad view of, of what we all can do to, to help out. Um, I'm kind of interested in some of these organizations, and maybe Dave wants to add in as well, some of these organizations that are forming around these different... Uh, you know, whether it's SNEA, whether it's uh, uh, some of the interface groups, there are things that we in the audience can do to get involved in a, some, of the, some of the charts have shown us, organizations that in between now and the next Flash Memory Summit, we can join in. So what are some of your, uh, you know, serving suggestions there? Well, thank you, Gene. Uh, w my shameless plug is that we're looking for volunteers, oh, yeah. and I've got a <laughs> session at 1.30, yeah. At uh, Ballroom F. After we grab If lunch. you are interested in uh, helping us set that tone. And yeah. if you can't make that, just send me an email, chuck at flashmemorysummit.com, C H U C K. Easy at to remember. But beyond that, but beyond, there yes, are some now, other. Now that I got my shameless yes, plug in. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's right, Jim. Yeah, yeah. But what are some of the other groups, guys, of the. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think you know, for persistent memory, it's getting involved at SNEA where I think there's yep. a, a lot of activity, and also JEDEC. I think that's the, the Could two places. Could you just places. spell that out? I know what you said, but it's JEDEC. J-E-D-E-C. -E -E and the previous one was? SNIA, S-N-I-A. OK. And, and just to help out, to, as a, a, you know, if, so that you guys remember, JEDEC stands for Joint Electron Device Engineering Council. Remember that. <laughs> and uh, and SNIA, <laughs> SNIA is the Storage Networking Industry Association. Yep. Yeah. Well, the granddaddy of them all, right, is IEEE, and that's I spelled I E E E E. Yes. So, uh, and Tom is oh, I'm the president, president of USA. Yeah. Yes. President so, of the US uh, section. if the, if it comes to organizations, this man knows. So I just it. call him. Just call him. But just I do think him it's Mr. important. President. I do think it's important. I think we should wind it up, and it's time for everybody to have a perhaps delayed lunch. But I think we did very well. We covered a lot of topics. Very pleased with that. And also, I think you guys are fairly open. And it might be uh, an, a good idea to give you guys even a follow-up uh, email or discussion uh, if, you, if people want to get more involved with what we're doing here at the Flash Memory Summit. 
So I think that's about it. Um, why don't we just thank our great panelists? They made it through. <laughs> made it through. Yeah, and uh, Thanks the audience. Thank you. we look forward to next year as well. So. Thanks, Jean. Okay. No problem.